Yeah, good morning once again. Welcome. Great to have everybody here. Um, yeah, we're going to be starting a new unit today, uh, talking about spiritual disciplines. And some of this, in some degree, may overlap some of the stuff we've talked about in the past, but this is meant to be a more applied type study and unit than we've had in the past. So looking forward to this, uh, this study. Uh, I think it would be very profitable for us. Before we get into all that, let's go around and pause in a little prayer. Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful for your presence in our lives, for your always constant care for providing for us and watching for us and being with us no matter what goes on in our lives. And we pray that you continue to make your presence known, that we would live by your spirit and we live by your word, bring you honor and glory. And you would help us to get through the difficult times, help us to overcome the temptations we face and help us to proclaim your word to a lost and dying world that needs it so badly. And may we live a way that helps to bring people to you and not push them away. In all things, Father, it is our desire to see your will done. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Yeah, so I've already mentioned we're going to start this new unit. I kind of want to just very quickly kind of show you where we've been over the last, it's actually been about a year since we started this class. We started off looking at the Bible itself. Where did it come from? How did it get here? How is it arranged? What's the evidence that this is a book from God? That it's not just something made up by man? So we looked at just the overall Bible itself and uh, some bit about the translations. Then we started looking at, well, how do we study the Bible? How do we understand how it's put together, the different types of literature? How do we properly use hermeneutics to understand what it means? Okay, So we spent some time with that. And then we looked at the church, that this is God's body here on earth, his kingdom is the church, and how we become part of that, and how it's made up, and how it's led, and so forth. We spent time on that. And then unit four, I, I titled Worship, and this is where we spent a lot of time with Acts 2.42, you remember. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, uh, to the breaking of bread, um, and to fellowship. And we spent a lot of time on that, and also got into um, singing. And we got into some disputable matters that, you know, worship is meant to be done by, God says, I want it to be done by spirit and truth. And there's some areas that are left up to us and other areas that, uh, you know, he dictates what he wants done. So we've looked at these different aspects of um, the fundamentals of Christianity. And now we want to get into this fifth unit, which I'm entitling Discipleship, which is an idea of, of how do we apply a lot of these things in our lives? How do we live some of these things out? How do we come more like Christ? And so this is what we want to uh, spend some time on now, okay? So a couple of just statements for you to think about. just want to get you kind of your feedback if you think these statements make sense or not. The doctrine of instant satisfaction, or satisfaction, excuse me, is a primary spiritual problem. You know, we live in a world today that wants everything right now. Do you think that's a spiritual problem or not? Lust of the flesh. Okay. Yeah, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Yeah. yeah lust of okay. the Yeah. Life. We want things now. We want them our way. Yeah, because sometimes God says, no, not now. He says, wait. Just patient. Yeah. Yes. I've been thinking about this. Um, Satan's biggest appeal is now. It is. It, it's yeah. all about now. Yeah. That's how he got Eve in the garden, and that's how he's been working ever since. If, if we can look past now and actually look at always, mm -hmm. because that includes now and the future yeah. together. Yeah. And so then now becomes accountable to the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking at eternity, right? I mean, this, this life here, I mean, 80, 100 years is short compared to eternity, but yet we still, we want things now we don't think about the eternal consequences oftentimes so yeah it's something that uh, you know a lot of people don't think about including christians oftentimes yeah something to, to think about okay how about this one the desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent or gifted people but for deep people yeah both of these come from a book um, where a lot of this material comes called celebration of discipline by richard foster um, kind of a couple opening statements and i think you know, it, it makes sense. We, we want people who are telling we want people gifted, but I can see people in the world today that they're intelligent, they're gifted, and yet they fall in the same trap of instant satisfaction, or they've got a, a superficial understanding of things, and they don't look beyond 
the here and now, the immediate, and the sound bites to really get at what's going on and trying to understand things. Um, and, and God, I think, leads us to understanding things that are more eternal and more important. Um, so these are things that I think are important as we go through these, this study, okay? So we talk about discipleship and underlying that is the idea of disciple. What does it mean to be a disciple? For one question. You hear the word, you know, what is a disciple? You know, it talks about in the New Testament, Jesus had his disciples. He also had apostles, which were different. But what does it mean to be a disciple? Follow his will. Follow his will, okay. Yeah, to follow Christ. You okay. Do his will. Following Christ, doing his will, okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, doesn't that make us all disciples? I mean, we're all here to learn and follow and Teach his live ways. like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of a disciple is somebody who is a, I mean, there's a lot of different kind of terms you put on a, a learner uh, or some, but really the idea of disciple is somebody who wants to be like the master. So they want to do as the master did, know what the master knows and so forth. So if we're a disciple of Christ, we're trying to be like Christ, right? So knowing what his will is, Christ obviously did the will of the Father. So if we're going to be a disciple, we want to do the will of God, the will of Christ. Uh, we want to know uh, Christ. And that's really the, the key idea of being a disciple, being a follower, a learner, and, and doing what he said. But who or what disciples us to be like Christ then? Christ himself, you know, his physical body here on this earth is no longer with us, but then how do we become, Tyler? The Word. Okay, certainly the Word. Okay, studying. absolutely. And studying the Word, yeah, okay. Uh, the Holy Spirit working on the Word in our hearts. Okay, Holy Spirit working on the Word in our hearts. Okay. Can other Christians help us in this regard? Yes. One another. I mean, think about Paul. He said, in, I think it was 1 Corinthians uh, first chapter 11, verse 1, says, follow me as I follow Christ. That Paul set himself up as an example, but only as he followed Christ. So, you know, we can be examples of one another. We can help other people. Okay. Yeah. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another to encourage one another to love and good works. Yeah, okay. Yeah, spurring one another on to good works. Yeah, okay. Good, okay. So there's a lot of things in there. And so in this study, we want to focus on some of those things, okay? Um, so we're going to be doing a study here and looking at these disciplines that are designed to help us draw us closer to God, uh, to be more like Him, develop deeper relationship with Him, sustain us through this life and into the next. Um, if you go to um, Psalm chapter 42, um, the psalmist here kind of em embodies this kind of a, an idea, if you will. Uh, we've actually got a psalm that we sing quite frequently. It comes from this psalm, Psalm chapter 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why is it so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for he, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mizmar. Uh, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you downcast on my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I'll yet praise him, my Savior, my God. I mean, the psalmist hears, I mean, it sounds like people today, it says, you know, where does God seem to be? Well, my hope is in God. I want to be with God. I want to, to know God. And, and this is kind of the idea. It's going to help us to draw us closer to God. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it also helps to free us from this, this slavery of self-interest and this idea of you know, everything's got to be for me and right now um, and fear of what's coming around the corner, uh, that we can truly live a life of service to God in love. 
Um, this is what God has designed us to do. Um, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, so 1 John being very near the end of the New Testament, just before, a few books before Revelation. And uh, um, Tommy's been preaching on this book here the last several weeks. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And so we are made perfect in love. We are drawn closer to God. It drives out fear that we can live a life of service to God. And so this is kind of the, the aim of what we're trying to do. Okay. And, and another verse that, that we quote quite frequently um, that I think these verses will, or these studies will help us with, in Romans chapter 12, the first couple of verses, Paul writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, plead with you, beg with you, in view of God's mercy or mercies, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, so it talks there about the idea of transformation. And, and the word there is actually the same word in which we get metamorphosis from, right? So a caterpillar goes into a little chrysalis, cocoon, and it's transformed, comes out completely different as a butterfly. That's the word that's used here, that we are to be transformed. It also used in the previous part of that, it talks about don't be you know, conformed to the pattern of this world where you mold something, right? It's kind of from the outside, it's molded, right? To be like the world. But transformation occurs from the inside, inside out. And that's what we're to do, is we are to be transformed, changed from the inside out. And that's what these spiritual disciplines we're going to talk about are designed to do, to help us to overcome the ways of the world, the ways of Satan, and be more like Christ, inside out. Okay? So we talk about these verses, but, but how do we accomplish this? How do we accomplish this transformation? Or do we? Is this something that we do, or is this something God does? Or is it something we work in partnership with God? I think we have to let, no, let God know we're interested. Yeah, I mean, we, we've got to let go, God know we're interested. And there's things we do... I mean, God makes the change, but, but we put ourselves in a position where he can do that. And that's what these studies and this, this, these disciplines are designed to do. And then also, it, it helps us to live, we've already talked about the Holy Spirit, helps us to live by the Spirit, right? Um, Paul prayed this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You know, Paul prayed for the Ephesians, prays for us, that we would be filled with Christ, filled with the Spirit, that we could, that Christ would dwell in us, and that he could live out his life in us. And we've got some other scriptures along this as well. Um, when Jesus was here on this earth, and he had a lot to say, particularly the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the Pharisees and Sadducees, I mean, if you looked at them, Outwardly, they looked like probably the most holy, righteous people that ever was because they were striving to follow to the letter of God's law. And yet, Jesus said to them in chapter, um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, Whoa, how do we get above what they were doing? Right? They looked like the most righteous people on earth. Right? But the problem was, it was primarily outside. Right? It's what they saw on the outside. It was not uh, the inside. Okay? And so, what the spiritual discipline is designed to do is to work from the outside, the inside out. Right? So that we will, in fact, um, surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees because it's God's righteousness in us. It's not our own. That was their biggest problem, that they were trying to have it on their own, okay? But it's also, as we go through these, we want to beware of the, 
the problem that sometimes we say, well, I'm better than so-and-so because I do these things and I'm more like Christ than they are. And, and Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 um, that we've got to be careful about this. And, uh, and he mentions it more than one place about himself, but I want to go here to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Because uh, Paul, here in chapter 10, he's defending his ministry, he's defending the fact that he's an apostle and he's out there converting people and doing all these things. But he says in verse 12, we dare not to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When, we measure, when they measure themselves by themselves, compare themselves with themselves, they're not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned to us a field that reaches even to you. Um, you know, he's talking about here people that are saying, well, I'm better than Paul, or I was better than Apollos, or I'm better than the other people because I preach very eloquently or whatever they're doing. And Paul says, I can't do that. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, don't dare compare ourselves to one another. Um, the only thing I can do is what Christ has given me and doing what he's asked me to get. Making comparisons like this is one of the first symptoms of pride. It is. It is a symptom of pride. And it's easy to do. Um, you know, and Jesus even told the, the uh, parable about the Pharisee and the publican. Remember, the Pharisee went and said, prayed to God and says, God, I thank you. I'm not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of everything and so forth. Praying about himself and comparing himself. And the other man goes and says, Father, I, I don't even dare look up to heaven. I'm a sinner. Have mercy. He's the one that received mercy because he recognized he was nothing. Right. He, he wasn't making any comparison. Wasn't making compare, except he's comparing himself to God and realize how poor he was in spirit. Yeah, he and that's when we make comparisons. That's when we compare ourselves to Christ, not to one another. You know, we're all trying to be like Christ um, and not trying to be like one another, although we can help one another. Um, but we have to be careful. And then also, while we're in um, 2 Corinthians, we turn back to chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Um, this reminds us again of the idea that we're living by the Spirit and not by the letter of the law. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we're competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Yep. The, the Jews were trying to live by the letter of the law. They were trying to obey that and thinking they would be found righteous. And they, it wouldn't work. It turned out that they couldn't keep it, right? It, it was designed for, but show us that we're sinful. We can't do it on our own. But we live by the Spirit. Um, the Spirit of God gives life. And so what these disciplines are designed to do is to help us uh, to be in touch with God's Spirit, to live by His Spirit, and to be more like Christ each and every day. So I kind of talked about this as kind of a, a pathway, if you will. We're, we're living a life that's on a path trying to get to eternal life, trying to be more like Christ. And in Romans chapter 3, um, verse 22, Paul reminds us there where our righteousness comes from. So we'll, we'll read verse 21 as well. But now, a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe there is no difference for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Um, you know, we're reminded again that our righteousness is not our own, that we don't earn righteousness and salvation by what we do. It's from God. It's a gift from God. We trust in God. We believe in God. <laughs> put our faith in him, and then we demonstrate our faith. And that's what a lot of these things are, is our demonstration of our faith in God by what we do, okay? And so we, by going through these, we gain knowledge, we gain understanding, we gain wisdom to be able to live a life for Christ. And it helps in our walk, and going back again to 1 John, in chapter 1, uh, verse 5 through 7, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. 
Um, this reminds us again that our life, our walk, is to be in the light, the light of God's word, the light of Christ, um, that this is the way we are to live our lives, okay? And, and I, I have this picture in here, and I've got it in here for a couple of different reasons, um, illustrate a couple of different uh, principles or points, if you will. If, if I were to, say, want to make a journey from here, on this side of the mountain or whatever, over to here, what way might I go? Well, to me, it looks like I'd want to come down here in this nice, green, easy-to-walk valley, right? To get to the other side. It's a logical thing to do. Logical thing to do, right? Okay. And the, I mean, that's what the way most of the world want to go. And I use this to try and illustrate the point that Jesus made about that the gate is narrow and the way is difficult that leads to life and there are few that find it. But the way is broad and the gate is wide that leads to destruction. There are many that find it. And in this picture, I see an illustration of that, that this flat area here, it's broad, it's wide, it's easy, but it's not going to get me, may not get me to where I want to go. It's easy. And, and life is like that. People want the easy way. We talked about, you know, we want um, instant gratification. It's easy. You're going to say something, Keith? Or, okay. Yeah, it's broad and it's easy, but it doesn't lead to life. This, this path across the ridge top, yeah, that does not look very easy at all. I mean, there's some places there, it's like, how am I going to get up that place or up this space? And that looks pretty scary coming down there, right? It does not look easy. But, and the path on top of that is obviously narrow. You know, you get up on top of these ridges and you're looking off on both sides, right? But that's the way God wants to walk, is that narrow path. And it's not always an easy path, but he promised to be with us throughout all of it and get us to our eventual goal, which is heaven. Okay. Now, the other part of this to, to illustrate as well is, um, you know, Richard used this in his book here, he talks about the fact that these spiritual disciplines are designed to help us to get to be more like Christ. And he says there's, there's two dangers. Um, one is some people want to say, well, it's up to God, so I'm just going to sit back and let God do it. There's nothing for me to do. And that's, to me, he's got an illustrative of the backside where we can't see it. It's like people are just kind of fold their hands and sit back and say, okay, God, fix me. Do it all, okay? The other part is that people want to try and say, well, I can't make this, but I can go down this way and get around. We try and do it on our own strength, and we don't utilize God. And so, again, we're not really getting to where we need to be. Um, so, yeah, the ridge does not look easy, and oftentimes it is, but it's the narrow path and it's the way that leads to life, and that's the guide. God is going to guide us and help us to get through those. We let him, yeah. And there's some who expect God to supply a helicopter. Yeah, yeah. And there's I mean, there's clearly times that God's done just the spectacular type things. I mean, look at Daniel in the lion's den, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Or, or the Israelites. I mean, oftentimes he's done that, right? He's certainly very capable. But other times, I mean, look at David, you know, and you look at what he went through. He's a man after God's own heart. He's been anointed to be king. And how many times was he pursued by Saul and pursued by his enemies until God says now's the right time? David had to wait, and there were tough times for him. A lot of those psalms that, that you read, or David, wondering, okay, God, why now? What's going on, right? Or look at the Apostle Paul and all he went through, right? Mm -hmm. But he said all that suffering had nothing compared to the glory that's eventually going to be his. So he was willing to go through all those things, right, to suffer all the indignation, suffer all the persecution for Christ, to help him be more like Christ. And so it ought to be, you know, comforting us, okay, Life's not always going to be easy, but I can learn from those. I can grow through those experiences, right? And these disciplines then are designed to help us to put us in place that we can grow and we can get through those places and God can take care of us, whether it's spectacular or just, okay, <laughs> i got to tough it out and, and get through this, okay? All right. Beautiful picture. Where it, is, where I, I'm not sure where this picture is at. Um, I'm guessing it's someplace in the Rockies. But I don't know for sure. Yeah. So it was a. I just googled pictures, you know, free pictures of ridge top, and that's came up. So yeah, or one of them <laughs> came up. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so we're talking about this idea of our walk in, in Christ and walking and walking these spiritual disciplines. And so I want to look a little bit more um, at these. Um, and, and what these are, these are very specific areas of our lives that we can exercise our faith in such a way that allows to God to transform our hearts and lives. When I mean, you think about, we were just talking before the class started, we talked about weightlifting, right? How do you get physically stronger? How do you build your muscles? Right? You sit around and watch TV and eat popcorn all day, right? No, <laughs> you go out and you lift weights, you go walking or jog, or what you, we exercise, right? We do something that allows us to build our strength and our endurance. The same thing's true in our spiritual walk. We do things that are going to help to increase our strength, our spiritual strength. And that's what these disciplines are designed to do, right? Kind of like exercise for the soul. And, and they're called disciplines because they do require for, from us actions and dedicated effort. I mean, again, we go back to the illustration of somebody wants to get in shape. If you go out and lift weights today, man, I'm all worn out. You don't do it for three months. Yeah, but if you do it every day, you discipline yourself and do it every day, it makes a difference, right? And same thing with these disciplines, that we practice them on a regular basis. They're going to produce an effort. They're going to produce something in us and help us be more like Christ, help produce the fruit of the Spirit um, that we desire, that God wants in our lives. So in, in my studying for these, um, I was listening um, uh, yesterday to a, I can't remember his name now, Anyway, he was talking about um, discipleship. And actually, I was listening to one that was called How to Spot a Fake Disciple. And in doing that, he would, just like we would do to find, what's the best way to find, to understand what a counterfeit bill is, counterfeit piece of money is? The way they do it is they train people to know real money so well that when a fake shows up, they can spot it, right? Know all the characteristics of real money that fake stands out. And this is what his lesson was about last night, or that I was listening to last night. He was talking about what the true characteristics of a disciple are. And if they don't have these characteristics, then you spot them as a fake disciple. Um, and he, he broke it down. He used three separate passages. And as I looked, as I listened to his um, lesson, I thought, well, this fits really well with kind of the three different areas of disciple, the disciplines that we're going to take a look at. So let's go take a look at John chapter 8, verse 31. Start with John 8, 31. To the Jews who had believed in him. So now Jesus is talking not just to all the Jews, but he's talking about specifically those that believed in him. Because there were many that believed in him, many that did not. But he says to the Jews who had believed in him, he said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. People like to quote that verse 33, then you'll know the truth, the truth you say free. But we disconnect it from the verse above, which says, if you hold to my teaching, then you're my disciples. So what does that say about a true disciple? Holds to his teachings. It holds to God's teachings, right? <clears throat> and we mentioned that early on. One of the ways that we become a disciple or a disciple is by God's word. If we hold to his teaching, right? We're not going to veer from it. We're not going to add to it. We're not going to take away. We hold to it. This also fits in very well with what we were talking about several weeks ago, if we remember in Acts 2.42. What was the first thing they devoted themselves to what? What was the first thing they devoted themselves? The apostles. Doctrine. The apostles' doctrine, right? And where did the apostles' doctrine come from? The word. It comes from Christ. It came from the Holy Spirit. It became the word that we read, right? So, I mean, being a true disciple means I'm going to hold his word. So I'm going to keep myself in his word, okay? So I'm going to abide in his word. Um, in John 15, 4, he says kind of similar type things. He says, abide in me and I in you. If the, the branch, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. Okay? That we've got to abide in Christ. We've got to abide in his word, his teaching, okay, to be a disciple. So these kind of goes back to what you were saying before. Sometimes abiding in the Word of God causes resistance in the world. Yes. And it's that resistance yes. that builds your spiritual muscles. Yes. So, you know, if, if it was easy to do God's Word, then everybody would be doing yeah, everybody it. Everybody doing it, yeah. Uh, but there's some, there's some price to pay. Yeah, there's a price to pay. There is, a, as Bob points out, there's kind of this resistance of the world. And we, and there's other scripture we could talk about putting on the armor of God, you know, so we can resist the devil in a scheme. And part of it is his word, right? 
taking the sword of the Spirit. Um, so God's word is a, a critical piece of being a disciple, okay? Absolutely a critical piece. Um, that if we're going to live in this life as his disciple, um, we need to abide in his word, his teaching, okay? So these first ones that we're going to look at, uh, we're going to talk about meditation next week. And what do we mean by meditation? We'll look at that, okay? We're going to talk about prayer. We've obviously spent a fair amount of time in prayer. We want to look at this again. Uh, this is a way to help us to abide in God's word. Um, we'll also talk about fasting. This is one that, as Christians, we rarely talk about this one mm -hmm. and almost never practice. Um, but I think it is something that is worth our attention. Uh, with cer certainly within the pages of both the Old and the New Testament, we want to take a look at it. I was just thinking about this entire lesson. We're not going to get there for a couple weeks, but I was thinking, in reality, next week we're having a little get-together you know, for Tyler and Matia getting ready to go down to Sunset. We're going to have cookies and, and stuff. I thought it actually would be probably more appropriate instead of having snacks, is to have a fast and to pray. That that would be more biblical to do. You know, so, but how many people would show up and say, okay, we're gonna fast, and we're gonna pray today, you know. But, but it's part of our connecting to God, right? So yeah, so we wanna talk about that. And then obviously studying. Now we've talked about studying, <clears throat> but we wanna come back to that. And because a lot of these things, we want to find ways to actually put them into practice. It's, it's good for us to come to these classes and study and learn about these things, but then what do we do during the week? What are you doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is what we want to take a look at. So this is one set of disciplines we want to take a look at. Okay? And it helps us to abide in his word and his teaching. Okay? Now the second one, let's, while well, we're in John, turn to John chapter 13, verse 35. Now this is a passage where Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. They're getting there ready for the Last Supper. And um, as they come in, Jesus takes off his outer clothes and puts a towel around his waist. And he goes and he washes all the disciples' feet. And he asks them, do you understand what I've done for you? I've washed your feet. I've set you an example that you should do with other people the same way. And in the context of this uh, discussion he's having with the disciples, he gets down to chapter, uh, verse 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, by what? By how you love one another? Right. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Okay. So here's a second thing that Jesus said about being a disciple. One, I can't be a disciple if I don't abide in his word. But I can abide in his word, but if I don't have love, am I truly a disciple? Right. So loving one another, loving as Christ loved, is a, a disciple. That's what a disciple does. And this can be a tough one for us. It's hard to love some people. Some people aren't very lovable, right, uh, in terms of feeling good about them. But the type of love he talks about here is we're seeking the person the best. Okay? So the disciplines we have under this um, regard, we have simplicity. This is the idea that we don't get ourselves caught up in the materialism of this world and our own self things, that we can have time for other people. We're going to talk about submission, submitting to one another out of love, out of reference for Christ. And we're going to talk about service. Okay. And we've spent a little bit of time in the past talking about this one. Uh, we're going to talk about it some more and how this helps us to, to demonstrate our love for one another. Okay. So this is a second peace then that helps us to um, be more like Christ some other disciplines uh, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends uh, John 15 13 this, this verse I've um, I, I've struggled with this one a little bit um, some of you knew no knew Clio Eldred he passed away here about a year ago he had polio uh, developed polio when he was a young man had polio all his life he was very very much involved in prison ministry um, he spent countless hours going to the prison, doing prison ministry, trying to get people to follow up and do that kind of work. But he got later in his life, he got to the point he needed help. His wife was his basic caretaker. She died. And he needed help. Um, and he was wanting, as I talked to him, he essentially wanted someone to do virtually this, to lay down, to give up whatever their life was, specifically to go and just to minister to him. 
so that he could stay in his house and he could try and hopefully get in and do prison ministry. And, you know, part of me says, well, yeah, we ought to lay down our lives, but also part of me says, I was wondering too, I didn't say this to him, but I was part of me wondering, Clio, what are you doing to lay down your life for others as well? It goes both ways, right? Because um, I knew he needed help. Our advice was him to was to go, his son had offered, his son lives in Arizona, his son had offered to put him up in a, down there in Arizona and to help take care of him. But Clio didn't want to do that. He wanted to stay here, which is what made a lot of this tension, right? Um, but I wonder about that. Would we be willing, you know, if it's a family member, right, your mother, daughter, you know, would do this. But if it's another Christian, would we do that? You know, yeah, Tyler? Isn't he talking about literally, like, giving your life, not, like, service? Good question. I think Good that's question. included, but it's not I, restricted to that. Yeah, I think it's included, but not restricted. Yeah, I think, I think you know, giving our life, you know, it, Laying down our life, you know, putting our life, literally putting our life in the line is one thing, but then serving one another. I mean, look at what Christ did. I mean, we're trying to be like Christ. You think about, and we'll talk about this more in depth, but, um, you know, his life was a life of service. Look at Paul's life. You know, that's a tough one. Yeah. So we'll talk about these things. Yeah. Um, I, about your illustration, I thought, aren't there prisons in Arizona? There's prisons down there, yeah. Well, the other, the other illustration I used with Clio that I thought made sense was I, I talked about a man who had a car that was servicing him very well, but the car was getting old and breaking down, and it could no longer, you know, it was taking more work and upkeep than it was getting out, than service was getting out of the car. And I said, you know, you're becoming kind of like that car is taking more and more work to keep you operating to go do, it takes six hours or eight hours of somebody to help you to do two hours of ministry. Wouldn't it be better to let those people do six hours of ministry someplace else and get somebody else to do those two hours of person ministry and you devote yourself in some other way, encouraging other people or praying for people. Mm -hmm. You become like that car now sits in the garage and the kids come over to play in it, right? It's still doing some good but you're not having to put a lot of time and effort into it to help it to do it a little bit. Um, but that was my, my way of trying to illustrate that he's, it takes more effort now to service him, to help him go do two hours of ministry. But yeah, but I did talk to him about that. He smiled at that, but it didn't change anything. Um, so and the third one then, in terms of ministry then, is the idea to glorify, to laud and glorify God in chapter 15, verse 8. Uh, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So when we glorify God, we bear much fruit. Now we'll talk, as we go through these, we'll talk about the idea of fruit. We can bear fruit in a couple different ways. One could be the fruit of the Spirit. We're exhibiting the life of Christ in our world, okay? But it also is the idea that we're bringing other people to Christ, right? And I've got another verse here at the end that um, touches on this as well, okay? So we glorify Christ when we bear much fruit, showing ourselves to be his disciples. So the disciplines we'll be looking at here are things like confession, we'll be looking at worship, which we've talked quite a bit about, so we may not need to talk about this one in great depth, and also guidance. Um, this is more than just simply studying his word. This gets into we're kind of one another, but we're striving to guide people to Christ as well. Okay. Um, I found this quote. Um, it actually comes from Rick Warren, who, um, or Warden. Um, it says, God is most glorified in us when we most fully reflect the whole will of God, the deep love of God, and the living spirit of God. And I thought that really kind of sums up what we're talking about in these spiritual disciplines that the will of God is reflected from the teaching and the word of God, the deep love of God reflected in God's love reflecting through us, and in the living spirit of God, we're trying to glorify God, living by God's spirit. Um, that these are what we're, we're after, okay? So in terms of our approach to this study, what we'll be doing each week, we'll take a look and define the discipline, what we mean by it. We'll take a look at what its purpose, um, why, why are we doing this, what's to be accomplished by it. And then we'll spend time talking about, okay, and how do you do this? What are some of the methods? What are the forms? What are the practices that can help us to do this? 
Um, some things like fasting is like, the Bible doesn't say anything. Um, so how do we do fasting, right? Um, and then we'll also, this is the key. Um, I like Bob Stump in his class. He always tries to get us to apply the scriptures. And on Wednesday night on Mark now, he's been giving us a handout. Say, okay, what am I going to do this week with it, right? How am I going to put this into practice? So part of this class is going to be homework. Right? We talked about this being home. We talked about it being a discipline, something you do, not just a day. So there's going to be homework each and every week um, to help us to exercise these things in our lives to be more like Christ. So one of the results of this ought, should be that we'll exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 6, 22 and 23, which some of you hopefully perhaps can even quote to us, right? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Anybody know that one? See, love, joy, and peace. Yeah, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing there is no law. So this is one of the outcomes is we will see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. It's also, we're, we're going to see this transformed life we've already talked about, right? Um, everybody thinks of changing humanity, but nobody thinks about changing himself, right? We say, well, the other person needs that more than I do. Well, again, that gets back to comparing ourselves to one another, and we need to compare ourselves to Christ. We're trying to be like him. Um, we will have an effect on changing the world when we first change ourselves to be more like Christ. You know, if we're wanting to win the Lord, win the world for Christ, we've got to be more like Christ. He was able to draw people to God, and this is what we need to do. So hopefully by going through this, this will help us. Uh, it helps us in our heart and mind to be more Christ-like. Um, in Philippians 2, um, verses 5 through 7. It said, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And this is what we are to be like, the same attitude. Okay. And we also, as we've already alluded to, we make the way of Christ more appealing uh, to people out there in the world. Look at uh, Titus chapter 2, verse um, uh, 9 and 10 in particular. Now, here in chapter 2, uh, Paul is, is giving instruction to Titus about a number of different groups and what they should be doing, different teaching and so forth. And in this particular, when he's talking particularly about slaves or, or uh, servants, but the principle is key. He says, teach lay, slaves to be subject to their masters in everything to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show they can be fully trusted so that in every way they'll make the uh, teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. When we live in a, in a life of integrity, honesty, not hip hypocritically, we make the way of Christ appealing. And this is what we need to do as we become more like Christ, drawing people to him. All right. So oops. so I have some homework for you. And I've actually got on a piece of paper uh, you can take with you. So I have three things I'd like you to do this week. Uh, number one, we'll close with this prayer. Ask God to help you open your life for changes and attitudes and thinking that are in line with his word and his son. Be more like him. And then in terms of study, what I want you to do is try and find three. We're going to talk about meditation next week. Find three scriptures that talk about meditation. It's not something we talk about very much, but it's in scripture. Go find three that talk about meditation. And then also I'd like you to read Galatians chapter 6, verse 8, if you want to read the surrounding couple verses. But think about that verse and think about what comes to mind and how does one do that verse. And we'll use that as some of our discussion for next week to talk about meditation. So that's your homework for this week. Okay? All right, questions? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's close with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful and mindful of your presence in our lives. We desire to be more like your son, Jesus, and we know we have a long way to go. We pray, Father, you'd help us in our study and our understanding here to know your son, Jesus, through his word, through his life, the lives of those around us, that we would be more like him. Help us to open up our hearts and minds to recognize our own biases, our own shortcomings, our own um, assumptions that may be wrong, to help us to put in a, a heart and mind that's more like you, to be more like David, with a man of your own heart. Father, may that be our will. As we go through these studies, 
helps me put them into practice that we indeed would be like you, that we can indeed show to the world what it is to be a Christian and that they might be attracted to your teaching, to your word, to your salvation. In all things, Father, we desire your will to be done. In your name glorified, through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.